Uh, okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the first lecture in the third speaker series on the capitalist mode of power. And our first speaker is Blair Fix. I'm going to introduce him in a moment. But before I do so, I'd like to just mention that there will be two other talks. The next one is going to be next Tuesday by <coughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Troy Cochran. And the title is From Colonialism to Climate Change, The Power to Externalize. And uh, the next one will be in November 1st. It's a Wednesday, same time. And that one will be by Dr. James McMahon uh, from the University of Toronto. And the title of that talk will be, Is the Power of Mass Culture Profitable? So these will be the two subsequent talks. And uh, it will be nice to have uh, all of you, and perhaps your friends too, to come to listen to very interesting talks. Uh, let me just briefly introduce Blair here. Uh, Blair is completing his uh, PhD in environmental studies. And his present paper is part of a very broad inquiry into the origin and significance of uh, social hierarchy. Um, his previous publications, and most notably his uh, 2015 book uh, with Springer, which was called uh, Rethinking Economic Growth uh, Theory from uh, a Biophysical Perspective, and uh, a more recent paper with PLOS One in 2017, titled Energy and Institution Size, dealt really with the connection between hierarchical institutions on the one hand and energy and growth on the other hand. But his inquiry, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. His inquiry is much broader than that, and uh, today he's going to talk about the connection between uh, hierarchy and the distribution of income, and specifically the personal distribution of income. And uh, I've read this paper uh, a couple of times, and I find it really mesmerizing. Uh, there's no need for me to say anything more. Blair, please. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a power, I'm just going to move this, a power theory of personal income distribution. And I uh, should probably clarify before I get into it that economists use these two words, personal income distribution and functional. Functional is labor versus capital, so the share of national income. And personal income distribution would be size, so how much income do you make, regardless of what type of income. So. I'm constraining myself to personal income distribution right now, but I'm going to expand on in later papers on functional income distribution. So a power theory of personal income distribution, everything that I'm going to talk about today is in this working paper that's up on the Capitalist Power site. Um, so <laughs> there are technical details that I can't go into today, which uh, are in the paper. And there's a lengthy appendix with methods and sources. So if you're interested, I invite you to, to read that for more info. But I'll try to keep my talk today to the, the highlights and avoid as much math as possible. So I'm going to, I have three goals today. Um, first of all, if you're talking about a new theory, you need to really address why you need a new theory at all, a new theory of personal income distribution. So. I think we need a new one because our existing theories are bad. And um, they don't explain the real world. So then after I kind of critique what we have for existing theory, I'm going to talk about the principles of a power theory, my power theory of income distribution. And I should say right off the bat that I'm not the first one to hypothesize that income is related to power by any means. Many people have done this over the last century. But my approach is unique um, in a few ways. Most notably, um, I give a very specific definition of power, which 
then allows me to do some measurement that nobody's done before. So everything is tied to hi social hierarchy and the hierarchical, hierarchical structure of, of firms. And then, of course, really the only point that matters is the evidence. If you have a new theory and, and there's no evidence for it, ideally you chuck it if you're doing science. So I'm going to talk about um, in quite a lot of detail the evidence in favor of a power theory of value um, and why it explains the evidence better than other theories. So let's get into it. Why do we need a new theory of personal income distribution? Well, we've had a bit of a, a revolution over the last two decades even the last five years in our empirical knowledge of income inequality, right? We have people like, like uh, Thomas Piketty publishing expansive treaties, treatises on, uh, on income inequality, and there are many other people doing fantastic empirical work. So I think we know more now about income inequality than at any point in history. Um, but that hasn't translated, unfortunately, into any sort of theoretical revolution. We still have really the baggage of the last century with us. Two main theories, neoclassical marginal productivity and Marxist theory, which is attached to the labor theory of value. So there haven't really been any, there's been no scientific revolution to correspond with this, uh, you know, <clears throat> plethora of new evidence. So what's wrong with our theories of personal income distribution? And my reading of the, the history of this theory is that it's tried to meet two mutually contradictory goals. And the first goal is to address, and this is my word for it, the Galton Pareto paradox. So I'm going to talk about what I mean by that, but I named it after um, Francis Galton, who is an 18th century, 19th century social scientist, and Vilfredo Pareto, who was uh, one of the first neoclassical economists. So that's one goal. The other one, which is to try to address it, is a contradiction, I think, is to main cons maintain consistency with the rest of economic theory. Uh, which is marginal productivity if you're a neoclassicist, or uh, the labor theory of value if you're a Marxist. So these, I think, are mutually contradictory goals. Uh, let's, so let's start with this Galton Pareto paradox. So what do I mean by that? Well, this guy is Francis Galton. He was um, an English uh, social scientist in the 19th century. I, uh, fun fact, he was the second cousin of Charles Darwin, and I think quite jealous of Darwin's work, but he used Darwin's work. He's the father of eugenics, so he has that dubious honor. But he was really the first person to try to measure um, human ability, because he was really interested in, inherit, in inheritance. So he, we have this word regression, which we use all the time, and it comes from Galton, because he had discovered regression towards the mean, which is that if you're, uh, you have children, or sorry, if you're very tall, you tend to have children that are closer to the mean height than you, which is regression towards the mean. Of importance to the talk today, though, Galton basically is the father of, of IQ testing and any attempt to measure human ability. So as, as soon as people started to try to measure different abilities, whatever they might be, uh, they found that they were normally distributed. So this is an example of, you could think of it as a, a measure of, an abil of ability. This is SAT score distribution in the United States. So let's say it measures the ability to write the SAT test, if nothing else. And we have, this is, uh, I pulled this off the internet, and they're kind enough to give us a mean and a standard deviation. And from that, if you do a little math, you can calculate a Gini index. Uh, which is useful because that's what's used for measuring income inequality. So a Gini index goes from 0 to 1, 0 being absolute equality, and 1 being absolute inequality. One person has all the wealth. Uh, so if you calculate a Gini score for the ability to write the SAT, 
you get a genie of about uh, 0.12, which is very low. So the conclusion that I think you have to reach if you look at the history of trying to measure human ability is that human abilities are very equally distributed, no matter how you try to measure them. But this clashes with the finding of Vilfredo Pareto. Uh, now, so Pareto uh, was working at the turn of the 20th century, and he was the first one to really measure the distribution of income and wealth. And he found that it was highly skewed. And he thought it followed a power law with, um, like, basically, he, he thought he discovered a natural law that all societies throughout history had the same distribution of income, and nothing could change that ever. And I think he was obviously wrong about that. But what, what stands is the finding that income distributions are very unequal. So this is a histogram of the US distribution of income in 2006. So I actually got raw data. So the Social Security Administration gives you, uh, makes public data available. Uh, so I took that data and just made a histogram of the income sizes in 2006. So it looks nothing like a bell curve. You've got the peak at a, like $5,000 and then this long, long tail off into infinity, off into Bill Gates' world. So we can calculate a Gini index of this, and it's about uh, 0.53, so halfway between 0 and 1, and much, much, much more unequal than the distribution of ability. So to come back to my point, this Gautam Pareto paradox is this. There's Income is far, far more unequally distributed than the observed distribution of human abilities. That's a paradox. And you're going to say, well, it's not much of a paradox. It's only a paradox if you assume that ability is related to income. Um, so if you want to solve the paradox, get rid of that assumption. And this is the path that um, some economists have taken and has culminated, I think, most notably in um, a theory called kinetic exchange models, which are based on really the physics of, um, of gases and the, the random exchange of money. These, have not been take, these models have not been taken very serious by, seriously by economists. So I'm not going to talk about them here. I'm going to stick to the kind of mainstream of economic theory. So why not? Why do we have to hold on to this hypothesis of a connection between ability and um, income? Well, it's because generally economists have been very conservative and wanted to maintain consistency with the rest of economic theory. And this is productivism. Basically, I, I think economic theory is productivism. Productivism forms the hard core of virtually all of political economy, uh, politically, political economic theory. What do I mean by productivism? Well, it's this hypothesis that productivity is the main cause of income. And then presumably you backtrack and say, well, productivity differentials are from some sort of differential in income. So, if you want to maintain consistency with uh, the rest of economic theory, you have to hold on to productivism, which forces you to um, hold on to this connection between ability and income. And this really stems all the way back to the, the, the formation of the field, I think, of political economy. And here's a quote from David Ricardo. He thought that political economy should determine the laws that regulate the distribution of income between the classes of the community. So basically, he was talking about functional income distribution. This was the central question that motivated the field of political economy when it started. And so out of this question, there were two main answers, I think, neoclassical and Marxist. And once those answers were formed, everything in the field was built on top of these theories of functional income distribution. So I'll just go over them very quickly. I don't want to get into the details because we'd be here for all day. So for neoclassicists, this is marginal productivity. So marginal productivity says 
<clears throat> a laborer or a capitalist is paid their marginal productivity. What does that mean? Well, if I add a worker to um, a firm, I then measure the change in the output of the firm. So change of output per change of input. That's the marginal productivity. And a capitalist is paid the marginal productivity of his capital, and a worker is paid the marginal productivity of their labor. So fundamentally productivist, here's Milton Friedman's famous uh, summary of it, to each according to he and the instrument he owns produces. Uh, and of course, this has grown into a huge field, most notably, I think, human capital theory, which generalizes uh, this notion of productivism from the neoclassical notion of capital, uh, physical capital, to, the, to human capital, really. And so here's a famous textbook by, does anybody know how to pronounce his last name? Mankiw? Mankiw? Okay. Very famous US economist. He says this is his definition of human capital. When workers are more educated, they produce more, okay? So everything is about being more productive. You earn more because you're more productive. It implies that uh, a CEO who earns $100 million is, you know, a thousand times more productive than the average employee. So you have to, if you believe in neoclassical economists, you have to buy that logic. Okay, Marxists, um, theory, Marx theory is different specifically for capitalists, right? So Marx said capital is about exploitation. Capitalists own... Um, <clears throat> the means of production, and therefore they get to exploit workers and get a surplus. So his theory of capitalist income is very different from neoclassical theory. But he tied everything to the labor theory of value. And there's a very, if you look carefully at the labor theory of value, it is, it implies that workers, specifically workers who earn more, have to be more productive. So this is I don't know if all Marxists come to this conclusion, but here's a famous Marxist. This is Isaac um, Rubin, who wrote, um, I think about 100 years ago, these essays on Marx's theory of value. And he, he's talking about two classes of workers, uh, qualified labor and simple labor. So think of qualified labor like maybe a lawyer and simple labor as a janitor. Well, why does a lawyer earn more than a janitor? They're both workers, so they're not earning capitalist income, so there's no exploitation per se, but he says the difference of qualified from simple labor is the increased value of the products which are produced by qualified laborers, which is a Marxist way of saying that qualified workers are more productive than, uh, uh, than simple labor. So I think this is a natural uh, outcome of the labor theory of value. If labor produces all value and somebody uh, one laborer earns more than another, I think it's natural to conclude that the, one, the laborer who earns more is more productive. And so this, this conclusion is virtually identical to human capital theory, unfortunately. But I think it's, um, <clears throat> it follows from a strict adherence to the labor theory of value. So these are all theoretical um, we can get bogged down in, in the theoretical aspect of this forever, but it's really an empirical question. We asked at first, so I said the Galton Pareto paradox was this disconnect between how equally in, um, ability is distributed and how unequally income is distributed. So this is also uh, an empirical question. Can we ex possibly explain income differentials with human productivity differentials. So I'm interested in actually trying to measure this. But as soon as you try to do this, you run into a measurement problem, which uh, most economists sweep under the rug. So what is the problem? It's this. How do you compare apples and oranges? How do you compare the output of Mozart, who composes music, to the output of a corn farmer? If you want to measure differences in productivity across all of society, which you need to do if you're going to um, have a theory of income distribution, then you, you need to try to make this comparison. Economists say, well, let's do it by um, comparing in units of price. So we'll uh, add up 
typically you use value added. What's the value added of um, the composer and what's the value added of the farmer? But this then becomes circular, right? Because value added is a form of income. So you're trying to explain income by looking at another form of income. You're trying to say, explain wages with value added, but wages are a component of value added. So in the paper, I break this down into an accounting identity, but I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to basically say, I don't think there's any way to objectively make this comparison, right? Anytime you want to make a comparison, you have to pick a unit. So I could, I could pick a unit and say mass. I'm going to compare the output of a composer with a corn farmer in terms of the mass of their output. It was just ridiculous, but I could do it. Or I could pick another unit, the embodied energy, or in any number of units, but I would always get a different answer every time. So because you get a different answer, that's another way of saying there's no single objective way of making this comparison. So this means then that if we want to compare productivity, the only way we can do it is to compare workers who do the same task with the same machinery, produce the same thing, right? I compare one corn farmer who has a tractor with another corn farmer who has an identical tractor. And then you're isolating only the human element and you have the same output, for, so there's no measurement problems. This is the only way I think you can objectively compare output and productivity. So economists have not generally tried to do this. But excuse me, um, it turns out that applied psychologists have, because um, many of them are interested in industrial relations. So this is a paper uh, that I found very useful from 1990. So John Hunter and colleagues did a meta-study of all a whole bunch of different papers that had looked at task, uh, sorry, output variability of workers doing the same task. So let's say you pick a welder uh, as a task, welding as a task, and you look at all the different welders uh, doing the same task, and you measure differences in their productivity. That's one task. Then you choose another task, like there's butter churners in this paper. And you measure output variability of butter churners, right? So every single task gets a different dispersion of productivity. So when you do this, then you have a whole bunch of different measures of output variability. And you can then compare this to income differentials. So this is what I've done. So I'm going to explain this graph. Um, very slowly. So on the bottom we have, on the x-axis, we have the Gini index, which again is a measure of inequality, 0 being perfect inequality, 1 uh, perfect inequality, 1 is off the axis to the right. Now the red um, distribution is the distribution of productivity inequality among workers doing the same task. So that's a mouthful. What do I mean? In this paper, they report <clears throat> uh, the distribution of productivity for a single task. And they use standard deviation. I convert that to a Gini index. And there's some math involved to that. But if you, you're interested, you can check it out in the paper. Um, but it's a straightforward calculation. I convert that to a Gini index. And so for every task, you get a, a different Gini index. And so what this does is plots the distribution of Gini indexes for um, uh, differences in productivity for all these, I think, 52 tasks. So we have this range basically from 0 to 0 0.2 and a mean of 1. Uh, sorry, a mean of 0 0.1. So because we're using, using a Gini index, this is then directly comparable to um, inequality of income data. So the blue distribution here uses World Bank data for income inequality within nation states. So I took the whole data set, which is all the countries on Earth where data is available over all the years. So basically 1980 till the present. So all that data, I plot the distribution of Gini indexes here. So we've got a big range, right? Down here in, in the 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, that's the Swedens and um, Denmarks of the world. And up here in the 0 0.6 is actually uh, South Africa. 
in some um, South American countries. So we've got a range, but the, the important thing is there's really no overlap but two, between the two. So you've got a mean Gini index for income inequality of 0 0.4 and a mean Gini index of productivity inequality of 0 0.1. So there's this complete disconnect, right? The, and notice, interesting, that this uh, mean of 0.1 is basically identical to the mean or to the Gini index we found for SAT scores, right? Which is a measure of ability. So what can we conclude from this, this chart? Well, I, this is my conclusion. I think productivist theories have a severe under-explanation problem. They propose this hypothesis that income is proportional to productivity. But when we objectively measure um, productivity, it's systemat the differences in productivity are systematically too small to account for observed distributions in income. So that brings us to a power theory of income distribution, which is my way of uh, resolving this so I want to leave productivism completely behind, which includes the labor theory of value and marginal productivity. Uh, how are we doing on time, Jonathan? OK. I'm going to talk for about 10 more minutes, and so we'll take a break. So what I'm going to do now is just lay out the basic principles of the theory that I'm proposing. And then we'll take a little break, and then I'll, uh, I'll discuss the evidence. So many people have uh, proposed power theories of income distribution. Probably most notably, um, Gerhard Lenski wrote a book called Power and Privilege. And he um, discussed at length how he thought income distribution was all about, about social power. So I'm by no means the first. And there are anthropologists who, who make this argument. So by no means the first to make this argument. But I propose a very specific hypothesis, uh, which is this. Income is most strongly affected by social power as measured by one's position uh, within an institutional hierarchy. So what do I mean by that? And where am I going with this? Well, to have any good theory, you need to have a measurement of power. So my measurement is specifically tied to hierarchical power. And it stems from really the, the etymology of the word hierarchy, which is, I believe, stems from ancient Greek. I don't know how to pronounce that. Hierarchies, maybe. Okay, it means it stems from this, this term sacred ruler. So there's fundamentally a, <laughs> a connection between hierarchy and religion, which is interesting. Side note. So what is a hierarchy? Well, a human hierarchy is this nested set of power relations between a ruler and uh, people who are ruled. And it repeats itself all throughout the hierarchy. And this is an important, this nested structure is actually a really important feature of human hierarchies because we're not the only species on the planet to form hierarchies. All mammals do it. Um, these pecking orders, right? But the, those hierarchies are linear. So you have the dominant male, and you go down, down, down the line until the most subordinate individual. So it's a linear ranking. Humans have developed uh, this nested structure, which in the paper I, I go into this huge foray in trying to explain the origins of this. But I'm not going to go that, into that here. What's important, though, is this nested structure and <clears throat> this repetition of, of a power dynamic, a power relation between um, a superior and a subordinate, a ruler and the ruled. So how do we usually define uh, social power? Well, uh, this is a very common definition. It's the ability uh, to influence or control others. So coming from this definition, within a, in a social hierarchy, uh, I propose that your hierarchical power can be quantified in terms of the number of subordinates under your control, under any individual's control. So 
And to make that very, very specific, this is my formula for power. Power is the number of subordinates plus one. So why plus one? Well, uh, the one means that everybody starts with a baseline level of power. It means they control themselves to some extent. And then from that baseline, um, your power increases linearly with the number of people you control, which is the number of subordinates. So what would that look like in a very simple uh, ideal hierarchy? Well, everybody at the bottom hierarchical level would start with, um, with a power of one. And then as you move up the ladder, so these, these people here have a power of three. Why? Because there's two subordinates, and then you add one. And we move up the hierarchical ladder to the level three, and these people have one, two, three, four, five, six subordinates, which means they have a power of seven, and so on. So what this means is with this um, very simple structure of a hierarchy, you naturally get exponentially increasing power with um, hierarchical level, which is important because um, in general, it turns out that pay tends to increase exponentially as you move up the social hierarchy. But there is a measurement problem here in that um, to use this definition of power on any individual, specifically, you need to know the chain of command structure of, the, of an institution, which in principle you could know. But unfortunately, most published data, in fact, all published data on firm hierarchies that I've been able to find, they do not publish the, chain of, the exact chain of command for the whole um, company. Instead, what these researchers try to do is categorize people into different hierarchical levels. Um, on aggregate. So what we can do then is not calculate the power of an individual, but we can calculate the average power of all individuals in a hierarchical level. So what does that look like? Well, this is the same hierarchy as before, but now we don't know the chain of command structure. We only know the aggregate employment in each hierarchical level. But we can still ask, excuse me, for instance, what is the average power of these red individuals here in hierarchical level three? And so what we do is just look for all the subordinates below them. So we add employment, which I use the word e, uh, the letter E, in level one and level two, which is 16 and eight. And then we divide by the employment in level three, which is four. So on average, everybody in level three has a power of Oh, sorry, uh, six subordinates, which means you add one, they have a power of seven. So this is very, very simple formula, almost naively simple. But once we've defined this, then we can ask, well, how unequally is hierarchical power distributed within firms? Uh, so I've been able to find case study data. I've searched Google Scholar for months and months and months and have been able to come up with six case studies uh, where they document the hierarchical structure of firms all over the world, um, US, um, England, Denmark. So it's mostly, I shouldn't say all over the world, it's mostly Europe and the US, which is you know where economists typically do most of their work anyway. But uh, so we, this is a limited sample, unfortunately, um, for two reasons, I think. Mostly, there's not a lot of interest in corporate hierarchy, but also the data is very hard to come by, right? It's all proprietary. So if you want to actually um, do this kind of work, you have to make friends with somebody you know, high up in a firm. And everybody I've talked to uh, who did this kind of work did that. They made friends with somebody in, in the company. As a result, they always, decide, they always sign non-disclosure <laughs> pacts, so they don't want to share their uh, their raw data, unfortunately. But still, with this, uh, this case study data, uh, I came up with this chart. And so what I did was calculated the distribution of power in these case study firms, so which is the red um, plot here. So it, this is for every firm in every year. I looked at the hierarchical structure, and I calculated a Gini index of power. 
and then I plot each, or so I, I take the, the whole array of firms and I plot the distribution. So again, the Gini index goes from 0 to 1, 1 being the most unequal. And we see that power, the power distribution as I define it, is, uh, is very unequal. So a Gini index on average is 0 0.67, but some as high as some, uh, 0 0.8. So we can then, because we're using a Gini index, compare this to income inequality. And right away we see that it's very, it's much more unequally distributed. It's power is much more unequally distributed um, than income inequality. So I, I think this is a good starting point because we're not, we don't have an uphill battle, right? Productivists start out um, with an under explanation problem. We have this hypothesis that productivi productivity explains income, but then uh, productivity is way too equally distributed. If we start with a power theory of value, we have this enormously unequal distribution of power. So it's quite easy to hypothesize that that could, if people use their power to um, gain access to income and wealth, then it could easily uh, account for the distribution of income within nation states. So this is a motivation um, for this theory. I submitted the paper to a fairly, very neoclassical, uh, fairly neoclassical journal, and they rejected it. And one of the reasons was he thought there wasn't enough overlap between these two. And I didn't write back. But I'm not worried about that. This is not evidence for power theory of value at all. This is maybe a motivation. So I'm going to take a break right now. And once we get some food and drinks, I'll talk about the actual evidence for this approach. So I talked about the, the why we need a new theory of income distribution. I summarized why I think um, existing theory is not good. And I went over the basic premise of my approach, which is to define power as, in terms of your hierarchical position within a firm, specifically this very simple definition that power is the number of subordinates plus one. So uh, what then is the evidence for this theory? And the way I test it is to break the, high, the power income hypothesis down into two parts, an A and a B hypothesis. It makes it easier to test. So the first part is, is relative income uh, within a hierarchy proportional to power. So this is basically looking for correlation between income and my definition of power. So that's, that's a bare minimum for any um, theory of income distribution. If you propose a causal variable, you have to show that there's a correlation between income and that variable. But this is only a minimum, right? Because we know that many different factors affect income, right? There's a correlation between your education level um, and your income. There's a correlation between your sex and your income and your race and your income and many, many, many other factors. So just to show a correlation between income and power is not enough. It's a bare minimum. If you can't find the correlation, then you throw the theory out and you've falsified it and you move on. But if you do find the, uh, a correlation, good. But then we have to move on to hypothesis B and test this, which is power affects income more strongly than any other factor, right? If you want to have a theory of income distribution, you want it to be based on the, the thing that most strongly affects income. We know that many, 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 many factors affect income, and I don't want to account for all of them. I'm not interested in that. I'm trying to isolate the single most important um, factor that affects income. So if we're testing the power hypothesis, we want to find that power, as we've defined it, is the most important, um, <clears throat> has the most, the strongest effect on income. So I'm going to start with hypothesis A, basically looking for um, correlation between power, hierarchical power, and relative income. So. Uh, I'm going to do this with the case study data 
that I talked about before. So uh, I'll start with a static relation. So what I mean by static is just plotting power versus income. And then after I do this, I'll talk about a dynamic relation, which means changes in income and changes in power. So here is just a static relation. So lots on this graph. Let me talk through it. First of all, the color here are the various case studies. Um, they're named after the authors of the case studies, not the firms, because the firms are all anonymous. But in every case, the authors study a single firm, sometimes over multiple years, sometimes just one year. So when you see, for instance, multiple observations of Baker, that would be multiple years. But I'm also plotting different hierarchical levels. So what we do here, on the x-axis, we have my definition of power, which is number of subordinates plus one. And we have a log or exponential scale, which means we go up by orders of magnitude of 10. Uh, so from one to 10,000. So for each um, hierarchical level in each firm, in each year, I calculate the average power of everybody in that level. So that's plotted on the, in the horizontal axis. The vertical axis, also log scale, is average income in the corresponding hierarchical level. So what we have then is basically a correlation between my measure of power and my measure of income. And we have very tight correlation. So each dot is a specific hierarchical level in a specific firm. And there's variation. Obviously, we wouldn't expect to find a correlation of one. But it's a very high correlation, uh, which is good. I should um, preface that, that it's obviously a small sample. It's one, two, three, four, five, six firms. And uh, I would like to have a larger sample, but I have not been able to find the data. Um, but still, we haven't. We, this is evidence for hypothesis A, that there's correlation between power and income. So we haven't falsified the theory. We keep going. And the second thing I want to look at is a dynamic relation. So I want to look at changes in power and changes in income. So I can do this. I'm using the paper by Baker et al. They made their data public, which I love it when Authors do that. They made their raw data available. And the raw data is for a US company over the early, you know, late 60s to the mid 1980s. So 20 plus years of data. And it's got payroll data for every, um, every person in the company. Tracks them over time, which means you can track uh, promotions and demotions. So I, and, and there's like 16,000 observations. So it's a huge data set. Um, so this is what I found. And I, again, I'll talk through this very slowly. So now on the x-axis, instead of plotting power, I'm plotting changes in power. And this change corresponds to a demotion or a promotion. So in the data, you can see when a, a person has been promoted or demoted. And that corresponds to a change in hierarchical level. And I've plotted that change in hierarchical level using color. So for instance, this light blue here, right there, all those people, that's a promotion up one hierarchical level. That's the most common. But you could also have people skip hierarchical levels and maybe move up two or three or four or five. So these individuals here moved up five hierarchical levels. Um, they got a huge promotion. But there's also demotion, so uh, people losing uh, a hierarchical level, people you know, going from way up at the top, way down to the bottom, demotions. So that's the color. And then the x, or sorry, the y-axis is showing fractional change in pay. So for a specific promotion or demotion, you look at the change in power, but also their um, fractional change in pay. Um, so just to make sense of this, this individual here, that's an individual. Every point, I should say, is an individual. 
they, their power for this promotion up five, hier five hierarchical levels, they, their pay increased um, what, by a factor of one, so that's a 100% increase in pay, and their power increased by a factor of like 500, okay? So the important part here is the correlation. So we can basically show a dynamic relation between changes in power, as I've just defined it, and changes in pay. So the, the correlation is lower than for uh, the static analysis. It's 0.55 r squared, um, which is to be expected, right? We're looking at changes now, which as soon as you look at changes, there's more noise. But still, for this is 16,000 plus data points, so um, still a good correlation. <clears throat> so again, we have evidence for hypothesis A, that we have this correlation between power and income. So that's good. We haven't, oh, I remembered what I was going to say. This graph makes no sense from a productivist point of view. Right, because the whole idea, especially human capital, is that productivity is from your human capital. And your income then results from your human capital, right? So what happened with these people who were instantaneously demoted, right? They walked into work one day and they were demoted and their pay went down. Did they instantaneously lose, you know, 50% of their human capital? What happened? Like, this doesn't make any sense, especially, you know, either way, instantaneous promotions or instantaneous demotions. It makes no sense from a human capital point of view. What does make sense is that income is tied to the position within the firm. And it turns out that that income and that position can be um, explained as a function of power, the number of subordinates under you. So, good for power theory, but it's not enough. So we have correlation. Next, we need to show that power in, uh, affects income more strongly than any other factor. So there are uh, different ways that we could do this, but um, I've chosen what well, amounts to an analysis of variance. So I'm going to walk through the math. Um, no, well, no formulas really, but I'm going to show you the reasoning behind how we measure this. And basically, we're trying to measure effect size, measure the effect that a factor, a specific factor, has on income. So we can visualize this. Um, this is made up data, but suppose we have a population of men and women, and men make more than women on average. These are the two distributions. So blue is, is men, and it's, everything is skewed, because when you're dealing with distribution, income distribution, you have skewed data, not normal data, normal distributions. So we have the female and male uh, income distribution, and then we look at their averages of each respective population, which is the vertical dotted line. So if you were to just eyeball this, no math, and say, is this a small effect on income or large? Does sex have a, a large effect on income or small? And in this case, I think intuitively you'd say, it's a fairly small effect. And how do you know that? What are, what are your eyes telling you? Well, you're going to look at this difference between the means, maybe, and say, well, it, there's a difference, obviously. But compared to the overall spread of all the data, it's pretty small. It's a small difference. Doesn't mean it's not important, but it's a small effect. So what would a large effect look like? Well, it might look like this. So again, made up data and men make more than women. So for instance, in the US, men on average make, uh, or women I think make 60% of what men make. So <clears throat> this is exaggerating hugely, that difference. But you would, I think if I asked you, is this a large effect or a small effect, you'd say this is large. And, and how do you know that? Well, you're going to look at the differences in means between um, the two distributions, and then compare that to the noise within those distributions. So relatively, that's a large effect because the, the differences in means is big compared to the noise within them. So it turns out that this is fairly easy to, to quantify. We 
it's sometimes called a signal to noise ratio. And so what the signal is, is difference between group means. And I'll show you graphically what that means. And then the noise is the variance within groups. And so variance, you can interpret that qualitatively just to mean a spread, but technically it refers to the statistical term variance. So standard deviation and variance, but I'm not going to go into the math. So what does that look like? Well, so the signal for a, this is a small effect would be here. That's the difference in the mean incomes. The noise would be the, the variance, or in this case, I plotted the standard deviation uh, of within each population. And so you take the ratio of the two, the signal divided by the noise. And because visually you can see that the noise is much larger than the signal, we would get a small effect. And if we look at a large effect, the signal difference in the means is very large relative to the noise. So this kind of, um, this kind of effect is easiest to visualize with only two groups, um, men and women. Um, but in the real world, when we're look, we look at um, factors that affect income, they're not neatly, they don't neatly fit into two groups. For instance, you could have education level, which could have any number of groups. I think the US data is typically 10 or 11, I think. So this definition works very cleanly with um, two groups, but we can generalize it to any number of groups. And all we do is move from the difference in means to the variance of group means. So we take a whole bunch of groups, we calculate the average income of each group, and then you take the variance of the average, which gives you a spread of the means. And then you divide by the variance within the group. So it's the same signal to noise ratio, same logic, exact same logic, but generalized to any number of groups. So this is the method that I use, but with a slight twist, because when we're dealing with income data, um, governments and statistical agencies don't generally report variance or standard deviation. They report the Gini index. So, but the same logic applies. I just replace variance with the Gini index. So the signal to noise ratio is the Gini index of average incomes in each group, or between each groups, and then divided by the noise, which is the Gini index within each group. Okay, Does, so any questions about that before I move on? Because this is, everything is tied to this metric. Excuse me, so I wanna make it as clear as, clear as possible. No questions? Okay. Okay, so to test the power income hypothesis with a signal to noise ratio, we have to divide people into groups by power. So every factor we're dividing people into different groups. Often this is arbitrary, right? I'm just using the data that the statistics agencies report. So for instance, the US classifies people by race and when they started they had no um, it was black, white, and I think Hispanic. And then they, but then they added an Asian category, right? But these are completely arbitrary, right? So you know, we're, we're, we're stuck with grouping individuals and often this grouping is arbitrary, but I just take the statistical data as is. But for the power hypothesis, we have to figure out a way to group people by power. But I think there's a natural way to do this, which is just grouping by hierarchical level, because the way I've defined power, it's really a function of where you are in the social hierarchy. So what we're doing then is grouping individuals by their hierarchical level across all firms. So everybody in level one, and each hierarchy here would be a firm or maybe a government, but I don't look at governments because there's not very good data. Um, these, everybody, every individual across all firms in level one, that's a group. Every individual in level two across all firms, that's another group, and so on, all the way up to the top hierarchical level. 
And so this is a very simple uh, visual of what that would look like, but I want to show you um, a nicer visualization, because I ended up building a model as, to supplement the empirical data. So I want to show you the model, and I will talk through it. So I'm just going to let it play once and slowly explain. So this is every little tower here is a firm. And these firms are from the CompuStat database. And so it, it's simulated data, but it's tied to, let me move this. No. It basically simulates the summary statistics that are in the CompuStat database. So CompuStat gives you data like average, um, and you can, from the CompuStat data, you can calculate average wages. But they also give you data on CEO pay. And what I did was I took the hierarchical structure of the case study firms that I talked about earlier, and I generalized the trends that I saw. And I'm not going to go into the math here, but it's all in the paper. If you have questions, we can talk about it after. I generalized the trends to create hierarchies out of the CompuStat firms and then simulate a pay structure. So the colors here, color corresponds to pay. So we have exponentially increasing pay as you move up the hierarchy. And we're looking at about 250 firms in the year 2010. So I'm showing you this simulation to give it an idea of how you can visualize this hierarchical structure over many different firms. And what we're doing when we're testing the power income hypothesis is slicing up these firms vertically into different hierarchical levels and grouping everybody into a little slice. And then we're taking this signal to noise ratio that I calculated and trying to see what the effect of income is uh, of hierarchical level. So I mean, you can clearly see in this model um, strong scaling of income. And the color here is exponential increases. So there's exponential increases of income, right? So the Delta CEO probably makes $10 million, but the average employee maybe makes 10,000. So the color is made, it, I, it's a little bit misleading and then it, it looks smooth, but it's really, really fast increases as you move up. So this simulated data I ended up using as part of my study, but um, it's to supplement the empirical data. Um, and also, you can actually see every little individual in here. They're little spikes. But I'm going to move on. Any questions about this? OK. So I'm going to move on then to the results of my study. So. That's how we categorize people by, by power. But then we obviously, to test this, we want to compare against as much data as we can. So I scoured the US statistical databases for income information for any conceivable group that I could find. And if you can think of a group that, uh, or a factor that's missing here, please tell me. I'll look for data. Um, sometimes the data just doesn't exist. So what did I look at? Well, geographic. Um, groupings first. So um, first of all, the difference between people who work in cities and or who live in cities and people who live in the countryside, however defined by the US Census. Differences between counties. Um, differences between census tracts. So the census tract is typically 10,000 people or so, but it varies. And then the census block group, that's the smallest geographic unit that the US government publishes data. A census block group is um, literally a couple city blocks. It's usually a couple thousand individuals. So those are the geographic units that I tried to calculate the effect of income. Then I, I looked at physical um, attributes like age, cognitive score. So that's like your IQ test. Um, so I included it because people measure it. Um, but it's, it, it depends on some assumptions from uh, 
So I had to build a little model to convert the way the data was reported. So I'm not going to go into that, but we can maybe talk about it after, or it's in the, the data appendix. So then race and sex. And then lastly, socioeconomic factors. So obviously, we've got to test education. That's like the, the darling of social capital, or human capital theory, right? Everything is about education. Education makes you more productive. Education is human capital. So we, I measured uh, the effective income uh, by education. And then employed versus self-employed. What firm you work at. Are you at Goldman Sachs or McDonald's? Full versus part-time. Hierarchical level, homeowner, renter, occupation, parent income percentile. That, that's an important one. So that's, you know, how rich are your parents? Does that affect your income? How strongly does that affect your income? And public versus private sector, what's your religion? And then type of income, the classic um, question in political economy, uh, labor versus property income. So. And for each one, then, I, I calculated a signal-to-noise ratio, this ratio of the Gini indexes. So here's the results. And a whole bunch of data here, so I'm going to talk through it very slowly. On the bottom axis, axis we have this signal-to-noise ratio that I went through before. So that's the ratio of the signal, which is Differences in group means, the Gini index of the differences in group means. The noise is then the dispersion within each group, the Gini index within each group. So then the dotted line, the dotted vertical line is a one-to-one -one ratio. It doesn't mean anything particular. It just means that the, the Gini index of group means is the same as the Gini index within the groups. So it's a nice whole number, and maybe we can divide. That's the, div the, the divisor between a large effect and a small effect. It's kind of arbitrary, but I put it up there just for a reference. So then that's the, that's the x-axis. So we're looking then, as we move out this way, we're looking at an increasing effect on income. And then on the y-axis, I have all the 20 factors or so that I measured, and each factor gets a little box plot. So the box plot shows the spread in the data. Typically, this shows a spread over time, but not always. For a few of them, like um, religion and cognitive score, this represents uncertainty in, in a specific study. But still spread. So how to interpret a box plot? The vertical line in a box plot is the median of the data, so the middle point. The box itself represents um, from percentile 25 to percentile 75, so half the data. And then the lines represent um, basically the range of the data. And, and often with box plots, you'll have little dots that show outliers. I got rid of those here just to make, because there's a lot of data already, and I wanted to make it as clear as possible. So the outliers are not shown. So let's talk through these. Um, so everything is ranked from the largest effect up here down to the smallest effect. So public versus private sector, this is US data. Um, public employees earn more on average than private employees, but it's like a few thousand dollars. So that difference, so I should preface by saying everything here has an effect on income. But sometimes that effect is small compared to the dispersion within the group. So inside all public sector employees, the, the Gini index is about 0 0.5. Same with the Gini index within private sector. So that small $2,000 difference or so is just completely negligible compared to the spread within. And we can move up, right? Cognitive score, just basically inconsequential and, and tremendous uncertainty in the data. Um, there's differences in counties. Right? There's rich counties and poor counties, but it's not a very strong effect. Similarly with race, right? Um, whites on average earn more than blacks in the US, but even though it, it's you know, $10,000 difference, it's not significant compared to the spread within each um, race. Similarly, self-employed versus employed, there's a, there's a small difference, but 
it's not that important. Urban versus rural, homeowner, homeowners earn more than renters. There's differences in religion, um, but it's small. And then, so this is interesting. Parent income percentile. Even though, um, even though parents, uh, sorry, children of rich parents tend to earn more than children of poor parents, that effect is not that large compared to the grand scheme of things, right? Um, <clears throat> so it's less important than sex, male-female male differences. So in terms of physical attributes, age and sex are the most important. Um, but physical attributes themselves are not important really compared to other traits. So the geographic um, uh, units top out with the census block group, which is the smallest unit. And that makes sense, right? As soon as you, the farther you zoom in geographically, you'll start isolating really high incomes and really low incomes. And in the limit, you zoom on, in on different households. And then you just recover the household distribution of income. So the more you zoom in to, on geographic units, I think the less useful it becomes. But still, there's important differences, definitely, over geography. And there's important differences in occupation, right? CEOs earn more than janitors. But it's still below the one-to-one -one level. So the only things that top the one-to-one -one level are education, firm, so what firm you work at, full versus part-time, labor versus property, and hierarchy. So the full versus part-time makes sense, right? Even if there are no differences in wages of full-time employees and part-time employees, if you work half as much than a full-time person, you're going to make half the amount of income. So we expect a sizable difference there. And then you add into that the fact that part-time wages are usually lower, then I mean, you get a pretty important effect. Then there's labor versus property income, which is worth spending some time on because this is um, not the result that you think it is. So we expect that capitalists would earn, so people who earn property income, we expect that they would earn more than people who earn labor income. But this actually shows the opposite, and it's purely an artifact of the way US Census data is aggregated. So they report all, for property income, they report anybody who has any property income. And if you think about that, I earn interest on the money in the bank, and that would be reported as property income. So anybody who earns any interest or any dividend, uh, or any, this also includes any rent, that's included in there. So for the vast majority of people, they earn a trivial amount of property income. So the average property income ends up being about $3,000, whereas the average labor income the, in recent years and the average labor income is about thirty dollars or $40,000. So this effect that you're seeing is the reverse of what you would want to see for like classic political economy. What you're seeing is that laborers on average earn way more than the average property income. But that's not very illuminating because the people who are earning a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars of interest or dividends aren't relying on that income at all, right? They're supplementing it. Most of their income is from labor, right? So what you want, what would be important to measure, uh, would be what's the income of a person who earns, what's the average income of a person who earns all of their income from uh, property, right? And you would expect that to be only the wealthy. Piketty has actually studied this, right? So the percent of, percentage of income from capitalist sources increases sharply with your percentile. And I didn't show this graph. So that would be something interesting to study in the future, but that's not what this shows. So I just want to clarify that. And then lastly, we get to what we're trying to measure, which is this difference, this, the effect of income by hierarchical level. So I've got three different sources here. So, um, and this, so this is all US data, and I commit a cardinal sin of comparing US data to to non-US data sources, just because there's a lack of US data. So Hyman studies about a thousand firms in Hyman. The, United, uh, the United Kingdom. 
So I took his data, this is purely empirical data, and I calculated the signal to noise ratio. But this is UK data, so you might say, well, that's bad, it's not comparable to US data. And in a strict sense, that's true, but the Gini index in the UK is way lower. It's about 0.37, whereas in the US it's 0.5. So that means there's actually much less inequality to account for, and there's much less potential for hierarchy to have an effect on income. So the fact that there's less potential, and we still find a large effect here, is important. And then the last empirical source um, is Mueller. Oh, no, I've reversed it. Sorry. Mueller is the UK data. Hyman is um, Swedish data. And I put a star beside it because it, it stu he studies a whole bunch of different firms, but not every hierarchical level. So it's incomplete data, but I've included it just because I want to include as much as I can. So they're both still higher than any other factor. And then this is the CompuStat model. And again, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail of how this model works, but it basically makes generalizations from the case study data about the hierarchical employment structure of firms, and then takes CEO pay data and compares it to annual, uh, sorry, average employee data to simulate the whole income distribution of the CompuStat firms. So, but importantly, I did a whole bunch of benchmarking in the appendix of my paper. I'm not going to go through that here, but the important thing is that we get a result for these US firms, which is it's model dependent data, which is right in between the two purely empirical um, sources. And all three of them are show a stronger effect than any other factor, right? Which is what we wanted to show testing hypothesis B, right? That power has a stronger effect on income than any other factor. And I'm just going to briefly show you this slide. I'm not going to talk through it in as much detail as the previous. But what this does is take the same data and disaggregate it. So the signal to noise ratio, which is what, what this box plot is, is showing you a ratio of between group inequality and within group inequality, the ratio of the two. And what this does is show you disaggregated and shows you between group inequality separately from within group inequality. And so a large effect, if you have a large effect, you want to have between group inequality to the right of within group inequality. So this is what we see for the CompuStat model, for instance. So inequality between different hierarchical levels of firms is a, between 0.7 and 0.8, the Gini index. Whereas inequality within hierarchical levels is between 0.3 and 0.4. Contrast that, for instance, with the public versus private sector. Inequality between the two groups, public versus private, is trivially small, like 0 0.5, or sorry, 0 0.05, whereas uh, inequality within the groups is 0 0.5, 0 0.45, okay? So if you want to look at this graph in more detail, it's in the paper, which is on the Capitalist Power website. So I've bombarded you with data. I'm going to stop now and just summarize. So I started with three goals. The first was just to kind of explain my ideas of why we need a new theory of income distribution. <clears throat> and then I wanted to talk about the principles of my theory and then what the evidence was for. So let's just go through these one by one. Why do we need a new theory? Well, existing theories, productivist theories, can't resolve the galton Pareto paradox, which is this fundamental dis fundamental disconnect between how equally ability is distributed and how unequally um, income is distributed. And then if we test and measure productivity objectively, we find that differences are far too small to account for differences in income. So that's why the productivist approach is bad. My approach is to propose that power or income is mo most strongly determined by hierarchical power, and I propose this very simple formula. 
power is equal to the number of subordinates plus one. What's the evidence? Well, we have, on the one hand, we have three different types of evidence. First, we have correlation between average power and average income. At the static level, we have dynamic correlation between changes of power and changes of income. And then most importantly, is we can show empirically that power, as I've defined it, has a stronger effect on income than any other factor for which I found data. You can't rule out some other factor that I haven't measured, but science is all about what you can find data for. So that's the evidence. And then I want to just conclude not on a scientific note, but on a, on a political note, right? All theories of income distribution have an ethos or a set of values that's attached to them, regardless of whether they're correct or not, right? So a productivist theory has this ethos, this is Milton Friedman again, right? To each according to what he and the instruments he owns produces. And this is an ethos of, of fairness, right? Um, that sounds fair to me. And what this does, what this theory does, is justify any conceivable distribution of income, right? As fair. So it basically removes any impetus for redistribution because everything is already fair. A power theory of income has a very different ethos. If we want to parallel that language, it would be to each according to his ability or his power to take. And that's not very fair. That's a recipe for despotism. So what this does basically is that a power theory of income distribution implies that redistribution of income is nothing but a check on power. And since checks on power are basically the backbone of every liberal democracy, if you accept a power theory of redistribution, I think it means that implicitly you accept that redistribution um, is an imperative to check power. Thank you. Pass on the microphone and speak directly to the microphone. We will hear you if you don't, but the recording will not take place. Yeah. So, who has the first question? I just have a quick and brief question about the labor property income. You said uh, Piketty shows that. Um, those who earn their income from capital gains are disproportionately richer than those who earn from labor. So how come your, your model shows such a negligible, statistically speaking, discrepancies between right. these it, two forms of incomes? It's because I'm, the, the data that I'm using measures something completely different. Um, what is a... I'll go back here. What, what you're saying is of interest is the proportion of income earned from capitalist sources and how that relates to your, the size of your income. And as you say, Piketty shows very clearly that as you increase your size of your income, the proportion of income from capitalist sources increases. And that's what we, that's important about how you would define a capitalist. A capitalist is somebody who earns most of their income from capitalist sources. But that's not how the US Census categorizes property income. They don't care about what proportion of your income from, comes from taxes. They just look at your tax receipt. Did you report property income? And anybody who earns dividends or any sort of interest reports a property income. And then they just take that as is, plug it into their data, and then they show you the distribution of all those tax returns. And because most people report very small sums of capitalist income, the distribution is highly skewed towards small incomes. And as a result, the mean is very low. Whereas 
the mean for labor, and, and that's all that I'm doing. My method is only to compare the, essentially the, mean, the differences in means between each group. And so this result is an artifact of the way the US Census categorizes data. It has nothing to do with your proportion of capitalist income. It's just taking as is all capitalist incomes, which are mostly small, with some very large ones, but still mostly small, and comparing them, and also very unequal, right? Capitalist income is much more unequally distributed than labor income. So the, distrib uh, the Gini index of dividends, or interest, is about 0.7 or 0.8, whereas labor income is below 0.5. So, and, and that's part of the noise, right, in my, in my metric, is the, the Gini index within each group. So as a result, you get this large effect, but it's not what you think if you are thinking about Piketty, right? I don't know if that's clear. This is, this is something that interests, interests, interests me because I think, and I've, I'm starting to explore this in another paper, is that there's obviously a connection between where you are in the corporate hierarchy and whether you're a capitalist, right? A CEO is probably a capitalist. They earn a lot of dividends. An entry-level employee is not a capitalist. So there, th there's this, they're not mutually exclusive, right? Measuring your, your um, income by hierarchy is going to be related to whether you're a capitalist. So I'm exploring this in another paper. Uh, but it, it's not what that shows here at all. So, and, it, and it's not inconsistent with Piketty, because they're showing different things. So it is possible that if you were to properly define the division between labor and property income and compare that to the hierarchy variable, the results will be pretty similar. Um, yes, uh, well, I. I have done this, this calculation with CEOs because CompuStat gives you this data for CEOs. That's, um, and so that's a tremendously skewed uh, population to do this calculation on. And so if you divide people up on that data by proportion of capitalist income, you get a, a strong effect. It's not as strong as hierarchy. So. Because what you might be missing here Capitalists who actually are not formally in the hierarchy. Exactly, right? They're just owners. And, and, and they can have an effect which is not incorporated by this measure. Yeah. The CompuStat is only executives, not the owners, and it's not private firms either. So, yeah. It would be very interesting to have this data. The way Piketty did his analysis is by actually by occupation. So he looked at income percentiles first, and then he, so we divide everything up by income percentile, and then what is the occupation? And he looked at executives, and this is my understanding of it, and then categorized them by proportion of capitalist income. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, really impressive statistical work, too. Um, but I'm just, I can't stop wondering um, why, or do you, have you speculated as to why certain individuals might find themselves uh, higher up, like the, the corporate uh, hierarchy? Um, so thinking about you know, factors like race and gender, could this also explain, like, why or could this explain to some extent um, one's likelihood of being in a position of power, which in turn you're, you're arguing explains income distribution? Yeah, absolutely. If you're a white male and you're educated, you're more likely to be a, a CEO. So I, I should say that everything, every factor in here that I've, I've measured is connected to every other factor, right? CEOs in, in, uh, who work in Manhattan live in, in 
well, Connecticut somewhere and they take the commuter train. So there's, they're going to be part of this effect geographic, right? So nothing is separate. Um, so if you want to do that and, and kind of try to explain why a specific individual got to where they are, that's important. Um, it's completely consistent with this analysis. This is just trying to separate you know, the size of each specific trait and show what's largest and what's smallest. But for any specific individual, you would have any one of these traits, right? You would live in a big city maybe, you would have a high cognitive score or low cognitive score, you might be white, you might be male. So if you want to explain the specific, in the, the income of one individual, you're going to look at every single one of these traits and make an econometric model. But I didn't do that because I, didn't, I don't care about a specific individual. You may, you might, and that's legitimate. I wanted to abstract and only look at the characteristic is how strong does it explain income. And that's all this shows. Does not, it doesn't mean that they're not all interrelated at the same time. Any other question? Think hard. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering if you could. So, your sample, your sa like the data that you have, uh, which supports your theory. Mm -hmm. What was the sample size again? You said that it was. I'm just or if it's different for it's different for the two hypotheses A and B. So for hypothesis A, which is just correlation, right? It is these six case studies. So it's six firms. That's a terribly small sample, right? But we have to make two with and and so if we had other firms to add to this mix, these are then these are all across a variety of countries, which is good. We, if we had other firms to add to this mix, I doubt very much that we would get a tighter correlation. We would probably get more of a spread. That's not that, that's not a problem, right? Because um, it's just, I think, very surprising that these, these six firms across um, many different nations have such a, um, a similar trend in their pay structure. Right. Um, and then, and this, this is a single firm. We don't know what firm it is, but it's the sample. The, it's called the BGH firm sample. Um, I think it's the best study of firm hierarchy that's ever been done. It's from the 90s. And the data is all online, so you can download it and manipulate it as you want to. And it's, so it's individuals tracked over time in that firm. So it's a lot of individuals, though. This is 16,000 um, promotions or demotions. And then, so that, and then th this data here is completely separate because we don't now, if we're, we're testing the strength of the power income hypothesis, we're looking at slices across we, ideally all of society, all firms. We don't have that, but we want many, many different firms, not case studies. So we can't use the case study data. What I, I'm using is then these aggregate studies. So for instance, Mueller is the UK study. He got data. Somehow he got access to data for like a thousand firms in the UK. And they were already characterized into hierarchical levels. But employees were. So he just took that data and reported averages for each hierarchical level and, and spreads. So I took his data. Well, first of all, I asked him if he would give me his raw data. He said no. So then I took his summary statistics and did some magic to, to calculate this. Um, but that, that's all. That's so. That's a thousand UK firms. So that's a pretty big sample in it. And and I show in the appendix of the paper that it's pretty representative of the UK as a whole. And then Mueller is sorry. Hyman is um, again a, a six or seven hundred um, Swedish firms, but he only studies. The upper, upper four levels of management. So it's incomplete. 
but I, I report it here. And then the CompuStat model, that's a huge sample size. It's 6,000 plus US firms over 1990 to 2015, but it's, it's a model dependent data, right? I take the, the case study data to kind of, def so I'll show you just explicitly because it, it's important. So these are the trends from the case study data. So you can calculate the span of control, which is just the ratio of employment between any two levels, right? So if, if on average people in level two have um, um, two subordinates, then the span of control would be two. If they have five subordinates, it would be five, et cetera. So it's, what we find if we look at this case study data is this linear, uh, no, it's actually an exponential increase of the span of control as you move up hierarchical level. So color corresponds to each specific case study. So this is showing you ver uh, horizontally hierarchical level and span of control. So I use this trend, this regression here, I use that trend to build my model for the, the, the employment structure of the hierarchy of CompuStat firms, because we don't actually know it. And then this is the pay structure. So again, there's this trend towards increasing pay. So this shows you the pay ratio between two levels. So for instance, here in level 13, um, on average, this level makes two times more than the level below it. And so there's this increase also in pay. So not only does pay scale as you move up hierarchical levels, the rate of increase increases. So you get this huge exponential, super exponential actually, faster than an exponential increase. And then lastly, this shows you this graph down here shows you the Gini index of income within each hierarchical level. So the dots here, and I added some jitter, right? So everything technically would be right on level one. I should have clarified that before. Everything here would be right on level two, but when everything's stacked, it's hard to see. So I added some jitter here just so you can see, but everything is discrete. So anyway, this is What's the internal inequality within each hierarchical level of all these firms? And there's no trend in the data. So everything, I, to build the CompuStat model, I just took all these trends and then applied it to the CompuStat data and tried to replicate the CEO pay and average pay of the CompuStat firms. Uh, and so there's a lot of math behind that. It's all in the data appendix. I think the only person who's read it completely is Jonathan. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I would just say that, I mean, it's, it's really impressive because you're using the data that exists uh, to great effect. But you're also, I think, demonstrating that, you know, there are a lot of uh, 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 political decisions involved in deciding what data we should collect to begin with. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I'm assuming, like, uh, imagining, right, statistical agencies, if they, right, if they decided to collect this kind of data, you know, we'd be able to, or you'd be able to, right, offer stronger conclusions. But nevertheless, yeah. I think you're you're doing a really good job of gesturing towards those conclusions with what you have. So. Thank you. Uh, and I should also add. One of the things that I found once I did this CompuStat simulation is you can then look at the inequality within various firms and rank them all. And I found that if you have six, we have 6,000 firms, what are the 50 most equal? And they're all utilities companies, almost all, which is interesting. And I did a little bit of digging at why this is, and these companies are tightly, tightly regulated. Utilities are very regulated in the US. As a result, CEO pay is under a lot of scrutiny, executive pay in general. So they're not able to jack up their salaries just in the same way that people on the sunshine list in crown corporations in Ontario are not able to jack up their salaries, even though they want to because they're under public scrutiny. And so all these crown companies desperately, the executives want to get off the sunshine list so they can jack up their pay. So 
it's not like there's no laws of nature here that say this is the rate at which pay increases proportionally to power. The fact that I found you know this um, this correlation. doesn't imply that this is a law of nature at all, right? I think if you studied Japan, there's no Japanese firms on here, but if you studied Japan, I, I would expect to find this trend go out down here, right? Because like, Japanese firms tend to be much more equal. So um, all that's important, though, is the trend, that we expect very steep scaling of pay with hierarchical level, but it, it could it has to change over time because we know in the 1960s that, for instance, U.S. companies were quite equal, and um, CEOs. There's a famous quote from I think Arthur Schlesinger, who, who, you know, somebody asked him why are you making you have the power to make your wage whatever you want to. He was a CEO of some company at the time, and but he only made ten times more than the average employee, and, and he said it would be unthinkable for me to make that much more. But things have changed, right, now. So the firms are way more unequal. So th these are political questions, as you say. So I, I'd like to uh, sharpen this a little bit. So if, if you look at the history of hierarchy over the past century in the US, we have probably increasing hierarchy for two reasons. A we have more and more large organizations. Governments become more important in terms of their uh, employment of the popular or share of employment. And we have uh, corporations accounting for a greater and greater share mm -hmm. of employment. And also, they become larger. So we should expect uh, measures of hierarchy to increase, more or less, not maybe linearly, but to increase uh, over time, over the past century. But if you look at the distribution of personal income uh, in the US, in the UK, in Canada, it is actually sort of U-shape or V-shape, uh, whereas the distribution of income in many other Western countries is kind of L-shape, right? Mm -hmm. So what we have here, if you don't take it in any point in time, but you take it over time, obviously there's something else that has a co-impact on personal distribution that could completely mitigate and change the direction of the, the personal distribution of income, even though hierarchies have steepened over the century. So th this is, I think, a very important question because this is sort of missing from the model. And you were just discussing that in terms of uh, utilities being regulated. Obviously, you can. Uh, introduce uh, policies and, and social transformations that are going to uh, remove the singular effect of hierarchy on income distribution. And, and that connects to the last question that you raised, which is uh, this, what you call the ethical foundation of the theory. So if this is about power, then, then any um, change in the social structure will have to affect hierarchy. Well, it doesn't have to affect the hierarchy. It can be a different type of change. You can mm -hmm. retain hierarchy and nevertheless change the distribution of income by other means. Yeah. I think I agree with everything you're saying. So I, at least in my thinking, this type of theory is universal in the sense that in any society that has social hierarchy, which means after hunter-gatherers, you I, I would expect, or the, at least the hypothesis would, hypothesis would be that hierarchy has the strongest, or power, has, hierarchical power, has the strongest effect on income. Um, but that's not, that that's consistent with vast ch changes in inequality, um, or vast changes over time. It, it doesn't m tell you anything about the level in, of inequality, it just tells you that that should be the strongest factor. So, so it connects, I think, to the discussion we had during the break, that power is a very slippery concept. And if, if you were to associate it not with hierarchy, but with the distribution of income, the final result. So power is nothing but its effect. 
then you can say it is affected by hierarchy, mm -hmm. but it's affected by other things too. And, and they could be uh, far more volatile or far more alterable sure. than hierarchy. And, and therefore, these are many different dimensions of power, as opposed to saying that hierarchy itself is power. So this is where the philosophical question of what constitutes power comes in. And it is a, it's not an easy question to, to right. solve, and it's very hard to kind of stick to a single definition yeah. here. Yeah. So I mean, the obvious question from this is I've, I've given a very simple definition and showed correlations, which is essentially what Newton did with his theory of gravity. He said, here's a formula, and it works. I have no idea why. And so the question is, how do people convert their status into income? And Jonathan is saying is that, that the income is the, reflecting their power, or is their power. And that's a completely open question that I don't address at all. Uh, it just, no, it, it's, not, it's not actually a critique of what you've done. I think it's a brilliant I did, uh, I didn't think part of, re yeah. of your research. And uh, it, it is just a question of, being um, very flexible with the definitions in order to be able to think of power in, in ways that uh, maybe are more um, amenable to other forms of power. Because yeah. if you define power in in very uh, strict way as hierarchy, sure. you are well, kind of closing. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the implication yeah. of this definition of power is that one of the most powerful pers people in the United States would be um, the Joint Chiefs in the United States military, right? right? That's one hierarchy with a couple million members. But they make a few hundred thousand dollars, right? So it, it explains the pay structure, right? There's mm -hmm. this, this every, as you move up the hierarchy without fail, pay structure, or the pay of, of um, officers increases. But they, they make a tiny amount compared to a CEO. So the theory doesn't explain that at all. But, and, and that's an important part that's also missing here is the public sector. It's not in this study at all. Okay. Just quickly to, to follow up on what Jonathan was saying too. Um, I mean, it's interesting thinking about power at a philosophical level. It might be interesting to like think about uh, like pre-capitalist hierarchies, right? Because I mean, I know I'm teaching a class in markets and democracy, and we're working with Heilbrunner's textbook, and his argument is basically that in uh, traditional societies, distribution is essentially explained by hierarchy, and hierarchy is maintained by traditions, a belief, you know, beliefs in a deity or whatever. Um, so that's also, you know, you're you're saying in many ways that income is explained by hierarchy, but then what is what are the belief systems holding this hierarchy in place, right? Mm -hmm. That could add, I think, uh, sort of this deeper philosophical question of of what power is to to your work, but definitely. Yes, anybody wants to add something? Last questions? Okay, Blair, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for coming.